Hello everyone. Let me start by asking you a question. What does a B-25, a C-54, a B-29 and a H-19 Chickasaw all have in common? Well, they were all components of the Hughes Kellett XH-17 heavy lift helicopter. If you know anything about military aircraft, you'll know that all those designs are old really old, and I was amazed that the helicopter that I will be talking about today was designed in 1946. Helicopters of the time weren't the most attractive birds to take to the sky. They were all kinda quirky looking designs, like the Bell 47B. They haven't aged particularly well. Then you see this giant thing. Yes, it does look like a mishmash of parts, but it's got that retro futuristic look that I really love. In 1946, the US Army Air Force issued a request for proposal for a heavy lift helicopter capable of transporting 10,000 pounds or 4,500 kilograms, which seems paltry in comparison to last episode, but you've got to remember the XCH-62 program started in 1971. This program started in 1946, a difference of 25 years. Hell, the Bell 47B could only lift 500 kilograms or roughly a thousand pounds. What the Air Force was asking for was extreme, and the design that was chosen was extreme to match. The Kellett Aircraft Corporation won the design contract. The aircraft they had produced, the XH-17, was powered by two General Electric J-35 engines which produced about 7,600 pound-feet of thrust. Unlike a conventional helicopter, which would transfer this power to a gearbox to drive the main rotor blades, the XH-17 would bleed air off the compressor section of the engine and duck the air through the hollow rotors. This hot air would exit the tips of each rotor on the trailing edge through four pressure jets. To increase power, Kellett added essentially an afterburner to the tips of the rotors, spraying and igniting fuel into the jet of air exiting the rotor. Kellett estimated that with just the cold cycle air jet alone, the craft produced a thousand horsepower, but with the addition of the tip burners, this was boosted up to 3400 horsepower. It should be said that one engine on an S64 produces 4000 horsepower, but 3400 horsepower is still crazy impressive given the use of such early and inefficient jet engines and the out of the box design. The blades of this monster were 130 feet long, 12 inches thick, 58 inches wide, and weighed 5,000 pounds or 2,200 kilograms, and would turn at 88 RPM. Kellett was having financial issues, and were trying to save money by using existing components of other aircraft, like the main wheels of a Skymaster and B-25, also using an extended Bombay tank from a B-29 as a fuel tank. It also used a cockpit from a Waco GC-15 glider. Kellett, even with these cost-saving measures, were still in dire straits, and so with the Air Force's blessing, Hughes purchased the program. With more funding secured, the XH-17 forged ahead and with the test rig being run in October 1949. After three months of testing only using bleed air, the rotor burners were switched on and boy were they loud. The noise of the rotor spinning caused numerous noise complaints and could be heard from 8 miles or 13 kilometers away. Testing with the rig progressed until June 1950 when the test rig rose 10 feet off the ground and crashed back down. The rig was damaged, but the power plant and rotors were fine. However, at that point, the decision had been made to produce a fully flight-capable helicopter. Numerous upgrades were made between the test rig and the flight-capable helo, including the addition of a Chickasaw tail rotor, which looks small in comparison to the size of the craft, but unlike a conventional helicopter, the main rotor didn't produce a major torque on the craft that would normally warrant a tail rotor. Instead, this tail rotor was added to provide directional control. In 1952, this bird actually took flight, granted not intentionally, as test pilot Gail Moore accidentally bounced the craft off the ground due to overly sensitive controls. The controls were modified and the craft made a much more controlled hover the next day. 
In October 1952, the XH-17 made its first public flight, with the man himself, Howard Hughes, even showing up to the demonstration. The craft ascended, hovered for about 9 minutes, did some circles, and successfully landed. Even before its first test flight, the Air Force asked Hughes for an improved and more powerful design. It would have been powered by four T-38 engines, with them being paired up and sharing a common gear reduction. Like the XH-17, the XH-28 would use compressed air to drive the tips of the rotors and would have been capable of lifting 50,000 pounds or 22,000 kilograms. A little bit more significant than the 10,000 pounds or the 4,500 kilograms originally designed for the XH-17. The Air Force awarded a design contract for the XH-28 in January 1952. A mock-up was even constructed and testing was conducted to create a pair of rotors that had a longer service life. However, by the end of 1952, the Air Force decided the design wasn't worth the cost and cut funding for the XH-28. They did try and hand the program over to the Army as a way of transporting main battle tanks and equipment, but they weren't interested. By 1953, the Air Force cancelled the program, killing both the XH-28 and the XH-17. The XH-17 lasted 3 years and roughly 10 hours of flight time. In its 3 years, the helicopter had lifted a maximum weight of 10,000 pounds and achieved a top speed of 70 miles an hour. The tipjet concept worked, but not without some rather significant drawbacks. For starters, the early jet engines burned an incredible amount of fuel, and the design itself wasn't very fuel efficient, severely limiting its range to only 40 miles and the blades also had a very, very short fatigue life, just about 10 hours. And the test pilot Gail Moore even said that there was a risk that the blades could shatter at any moment. There are advantages in using a chip jet powered design, like I said on my Patreon. As the helicopter gets bigger, the size, weight, and the cost of the transmission increase at a much higher rate than the helicopter size and soon become limiting factors. Tip jets don't have the need for diverting power to counter torque and increase moment of inertia. Other companies did experiment with extremely large tip jet powered designs, some even just sticking the jet on the tip of the rotor blade. For example, the Hiller Type 1108, which was described as an aerial crane. Hiller had developed a few tip jet powered designs in hopes of securing military funding. But given the list of problems, including structural problems, efficiency, and the incredibly loud noise, they didn't have much interest. I also can't help but imagine an engine out procedure in this bird. In a conventional helicopter, you can just use the force of wind to land the helicopter safely in what's called an auto rotation. But would an engine cause stability issues if it were to go out in this thing? The intakes would also cause a tremendous amount of drag, and given the immense weight, 60,000 pounds or 27,000 kilograms, I can imagine the situation ending in catastrophe. But what about today? Surely with more efficient, lighter, reliable engines, we see companies revisiting this concept. Well in 2003, this thing took flight. It's the Boeing X-50 Dragonfly CRW or canard rotor wing demonstrator. The principle was that the helicopter rotor could stop in flight and act as a fixed wing. It was an interesting adaptation of the VTOL concept. It was powered by a single turbofan engine that when in rotor mode would duct its exhaust to the tips of the rotor blades. When it wanted to go into forward flight, the exhaust was directed to the rear and the rotor was locked into position. I will be doing a video about this craft and whether the program was a success or not in the future. Will we see any other companies try this concept in the future? Probably not. As I said in the previous episode, Super Heavy Lift is an incredibly niche role helicopters are designed to fill. What company would put the time and effort into designing such a craft that ultimately wouldn't have much purpose? It would certainly be more attainable than 77 years ago, thanks to modern composite materials and engines, but I don't think there is a market for such an extremely large helicopter. Hybrid airships can already carry extremely large amounts of cargo. 
They have the ability to hover, and are far more fuel efficient. They are also a proven design. Ultimately, I don't see this design being developed into a heavy lift helicopter. If a tipjet powered design were to be produced, I think it would resemble the Dragonfly and not the Hughes XH17. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.